don't really think about immunosuppression in the context of genetic disorders. That's sort of an unusual kind of thing. Um, there was some wonderful work by David Pierce out of Stanford Children's who found that there are autoantibodies that are generated in children who have CLN3 disease. Um, that seam finding is present in the mouse model for that disease. And that if you modulate that, so if you make those antibodies go away, or if you suppress the immune system, and he had several models by which he tested that, that the mice do better. They do better with respect to not having those antibodies. They, uh, things look better under the microscope in terms of how many neurons are present and um, how much information is present. And they do better in terms of their function. They're able to stay on a rotating rod longer. Um, they're able to do better with motor function and survival. And so when we thought about the presence of those antibodies and how that might relate to the function of the CLN3 protein or how that might relate to secondary processes that can contribute to the pathophysiology of the disease, we thought that that was something that was prudent and worth testing in children with Batten disease, uh, with the CLN3 form specifically. But before going down that road, we really wanted to make sure that it was something that was going to be reasonably safe. So the diseases for which mycophenolate is approved, they're very different. And you know, we know that there were emerging things that we were learning about children who had CLN3 disease. We've been so focused on the brain for a long time in this disorder, but we were recently learning that, well, there can be heart kinds of effects. And we don't know what kind of other organ systems can be involved. So we really thought that a short-term exposure um, something that was brief, making sure that that at least was well tolerated made a lot of sense before moving on to a long-term study. And so that's what we did. So we found that children did really well. And so we found that children um, and adolescents who participated in the study, it was a crossover study where they had a period of placebo and a period of mycophenolate or vice versa. Um, we did that in a blinded manner that children actually really tolerated very well. Um, there were sometimes gastrointestinal kinds of side effects, um, diarrhea, nausea, but all of those adverse effects were relatively mild um, and weren't limiting in terms of being able to continue on the dose that they were assigned. And so in the short term, uh, we saw that this actually is a strategy. This is a medication that children and adolescents can take um, and can take well. And we have questions that remain, though, about what that actually means for Batten disease, what that means for patients who have Batten disease, and whether or not this is a medication that actually might slow disease progression. So a long-term exposure is something that will be needed to really understand what that means in terms of efficacy and whether or not this actually can slow disease progression. So the next steps are actually to develop a, a long-term study to evaluate whether or not we see improvement in symptoms or we see slowing of the accumulation of symptoms. And so we're thinking about that right now and how we go about putting that together and trying to think about that in the context of a very uncommon disease where there are right now on the horizon more than one different kind of approach therapeutically to test and how we think about how do we work with the community to figure out how we move forward. Um, you know whether or not we can have multiple trials in one small patient population it's not so clear that, that we can really do that and do that well. So trying to think about how we prioritize how we move forward I think that's really a focus right now.